From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. Now, folks, you've heard us talk about Bitcoin before. Uh, Bitcoin is a specific sort of uh, alternative currency or cryptocurrency, but it's it's not alone in that field. It's the most well-known of several different similar things like Ethereum or Dogecoin, personal favorite of mine. These are popularly called crypto or coins. Unlike currency of previous eras, Bitcoin is not backed by any government or corporation. It's decentralized, meaning there is no issuing authority, no central banking system. Depending on which sources you ask, this is either one of the greatest revolutions, innovations in financial history, or it's a grift, or, well, first things first. Here are the facts. We we want to give you a brief recap of how uh, Bitcoin works, how blockchain works, but we're gonna we're gonna just go high level because longtime listeners, you've heard us discuss this in depth in previous episodes. Sometimes with the help of our pal Jonathan Strickland. Yeah, he was certainly the first person that I ever even heard about blockchain and cryptocurrency from many years ago. Yeah, so let's let's talk about it. Uh, it runs on peer to peer. This is very important. It's a network that is peer to peer, like old school stuff that you used to do on the internet, probably, where uh, somebody's computer is running part of the brain that's running the game you're playing. Or if you're, uh, let's say, using LimeWire or something to share stuff across a network, that was a a well-known peer-to-peer network. And as you said, Ben, the most important thing is that there's no centralized server that is running any of this stuff. Yeah, if you're using Bitcoin, uh, each user's computer is part of this larger network, what you could rightly call an ecosystem, and it shares the burden of generating Bitcoins and logging transactions. It's this decentralized nature that makes Bitcoin arguably impervious so far to things like government intervention, whether that is by monitoring the way you would monitor uh, orthodox banking transactions or regulation. And it's the weird thing is, okay, so we're going to describe some things that may sound complicated, but if you are an end user, if you are like so many people getting into Bitcoin, a little dipping your toe in a little bit at a time, uh, you'll find that it is astonishingly simple to do so. You get a Bitcoin wallet. This encrypts and maintains your Bitcoin balance on your computer, smartphone, or in the cloud. And this happens with any any other version of cryptocurrency. Then you can use your bank account or a credit card, which I think is kind of dangerous, uh, or another form of payment to, to get Bitcoins, to up your wallet, or for most people, realistically, a fraction of Bitcoins. Can you use a credit card to buy securities, buy traditional stocks and bonds? I wouldn't know. I'm an enemy of credit cards. I just wonder. I mean, it, you know, it, it seems it, you're, it seems dangerous. It seems like a slippery slope if you're not actually converting uh, wealth, you know, into stocks. Then you're just gambling essentially with with credit. I, it's you know you can't use a credit card to pay off another credit card. I, I just I'm, or okay, to play the, that. or to play the lottery, right? Or to go to casinos. So I would think probably there's some guideline with the FTC uh, that doesn't allow you to buy stocks with uh, credit cards. So that's not the case with uh, with crypto. You can you can buy it with credit cards, which is super slippery. Um, and it's a little more complicated than some maybe more you know kind of technophobe type folks might be uh, cut out for because you do have to. You know, getting the wallet is one thing, but then also to get the Bitcoin, you have to transfer it to the wallet. Because if you keep it on an exchange, which is where you buy it, that leaves it more kind of uh, susceptible to 
things. <laughs> <laughs> which was to all many, sorts. Yeah, to all exactly to all sorts of things. So if in, in the code there's like a like a string of, of weird digits uh, that are, you know, your key for transferring, you know, the purchase to your wallet. And if you get just one digit of that wrong, then it goes away into the ether, never to be seen again. And you have to be careful with any financial decisions because uh, I like the way it was put earlier somewhere on the internet, probably Twitter, somebody wrote to me at Bimble in HSW, or I found it somewhere. And they said, you know, if you let someone shenan, one thing's for sure, they're going to shenan again. Sure are. Sort of fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice. All Can't be stuff. fooled again. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, so this is relatively um, uncomplicated. There is a learning curve for people entering as end users. But before any of that happens, before Bitcoin can be uh, transferred, can be spent, can be used at all, it has to be made. And this happens via a mining process, aka a big reason uh, that many of our gamer friends in the audience today still don't have a PS5 <laughs> due to a chip shortage. Uh, this this mining process uses computers. You get a mining app. It's free. They're out there. Uh, and mining requires the entire network of these, let's call them Bitcoin participant computers, to do essentially a ton of difficult math problems, a bunch of number crunching. And there's a set amount of uh, work that these do. And when you reach that threshold of work, you get rewarded with Bitcoin. And in the early days, there would be people who were just at their houses, maybe setting up their own kind of uh, computer networks that would just do this work, would just crunch these numbers and make them Bitcoin. And some of those people made uh, quite a killing off of this. But, and I'll say the quiet part out loud, just with things like, with any uh, quote unquote disruptive industry like podcasting, Pretty soon, the big fish got involved, and now some people and some very powerful organizations have spent thousands, thousands, quite possibly millions of dollars making computers specifically to mine Bitcoin and nothing else. This became, and this is fair to call it such, this became a global arms race of sorts, a digital cutthroat arm race. Uh, one stat I found that I thought was pretty illuminating, shout out Illumination Global Unlimited. As of 2020, about two years ago, a full 19% of the world's GPU, graphic processing unit production, went entirely to mining, not all crypto, but just Ethereum. And this was a huge, huge factor in the ongoing global computer chip shortage. That means that even if you never cared about crypto, if you never heard about it, had no plans to participate in it, you were still being affected in a very real and sometimes dangerous way. To my understanding as well, the way um, mining works is you, these GPUs are are the blockchain. They're part and parcel. They are they are verifying transactions uh, using by solving these complex, you know, like puzzles, essentially, like really complex math problems. So in order to for the blockchain to function, since it is decentralized, it's sort of like crowdsourcing uh, SETI, you know, the way SETI uses like, you know, people can combine all of their computer processors together in a way that allows them to participate in certain algorithms that are taking place, you know, through a, a thin organization like SETI to monitor, you know, uh, space, et cetera. So when these people that are, you know, putting forth all of this power in from their personal, you know, uh, property, uh, solve these equations, these equations, they are rewarded essentially with a little bit of a Bitcoin, not like a, a whole Bitcoin. You got to do a gazillion of these to make any meaningful cash. Is that y'all's understanding as well? That's correct. Yeah. The, uh, in the, the SETI crowdsourcing is not a bad comparison because, uh, as we'll find the rules of the game are set to evolve over time. Uh, right now, just as a result of the Bitcoin kind of gold rush throughout four of what we'll call crypto winters, uh, as a result of that gold rush, almost 170 distinct industries have been affected by the computer chip shortage. You can only make so many due to supply chain issues, even pre-pandemic. Uh, and the thing is that these chips can be used 
for all sorts of stuff that is not involved with Bitcoin. So you could argue that at a certain threshold, every time somebody is scooping up technology and dedicating it to mining Bitcoin, they're scooping it away from uh, these other industries. Goldman Sachs specifically found 169 industries have been impacted. This can't go on forever, you might be thinking. And if so, if you're thinking that, you're on the money. Because here's how the rules change. There is a cap. There are only 21 million Bitcoins that can ever exist. And to create, to like sort of uh, manage this generation, the Bitcoin network adjusts the exact amount of work and number crunching required to make coins. So they, they adjust it such that the number of Bitcoins will rise at a steady predetermined rate. And it'll continue to do this, the reasoning goes, until the number of Bitcoins in circulation reaches that 21 million cap. Right now, that's projected to occur around 2140. So if you are hearing this in 2140, write to the show. Let us know if uh, that ended up being correct. Is it complicated? Yeah, of course. But don't make a mistake. There was money to be made. So everyone for a while went absolutely nuts for this. They went bonkers and bananas. Your faithful correspondents, by the way, some of our friends included. As crypto's popularity skyrocketed, people began learning more about one of my favorite parts of the story. It's incredibly shady origin. And I think we have to talk about that. This is a little bit, here's where it gets crazy, uh, but it is worth knowing if you're not aware of this uh, previously. Matt, no, who made, who made Bitcoin? Who invented it? Satan. <laughs> is that, uh, Final is that answer. English for Satoshi Nakamoto? <laughs> no. Final answer. No lifeline. By yeah. the way, we're never ever making it yeah. to 20. 2140. No one was no one is listening to this in 2140 guys. I have I have bad news. Civilization collapses in uh less than two decades. So at the very <laughs> least been engulfed engulfed by the sun, Sorry. you know, who knows. Not making wow. it. All right. Well, so I'll have to work with the AI versions of you guys. Uh it's going to make me sad. Already in the works, buddy. <laughs> you uh, won't be. <laughs> and they'll, they'll probably be really high quality by then. Yeah, that's the thing. So our optimism versus pessimism versus what some would call realism aside, uh, the truth is this. The identity of Bitcoin's creator is a huge mystery. The story really starts with a mystery. The phrase cryptocurrency, as, a, as Neil Stevenson, as it may sound, it was not coined by him. It, the concept first comes out in 1998. A person named Wei Dai uh, mentions this idea, pitches it on a mailing list for something called cypherpunks, C-Y-P-H-E-R, punks. And Bitcoin's creator, who went by the identity or the persona Satoshi Nakamoto, in 2009, Satoshi publishes the first specification, like practical description of Bitcoin and proof of concept. And then later, toward the end of 2010, this identity, this persona, ghosts. It's gone. It's off the grid. Uh, and all we know really is that this person or people using this handle did create the idea, the practical application of it, and then did disappear. And we know that that name, that handle is not their real name. Bitcoin.org, by the way, is low-key hilarious about this because they have to dispel a lot of fear, right? And they say, this person, whom they identify as male, by the way, uh, they say this person does, does not currently control Bitcoin and that due to the nature of the open source tech, this is my favorite quote here. It, you can find it on Bitcoin.org. They say, quote, the identity of Bitcoin's inventor is probably as relevant today as the identity of the person who invented paper. And we don't know who invented paper. That's the point they're making. Well, it, it, it's mimetic, though. It's like a self-replicating system, you know, once it kind of gets off and running, right? At, at that point, it doesn't. It's like, who invented DNA? <laughs> I mean, well, again, it's a well, silly comparison, I think, obviously. I think you just I mean, insert the word flash into that sentence. Invented flash paper. <laughs> okay. Matt, Matt's got some some hot takes, some 
flash hot takes. Uh, but no, but it's true. I mean, like, you know, at this point, it's kind of irrelevant. It'd be interesting to know. But would there be a reason you think? I mean, I, I could think of many why that person would not come forward because they probably don't want to be don't want to have their spot blown up, essentially, you know, mm-hmm. because it is something that's pretty controversial still. And I would imagine they've cashed out and they're probably living the yacht life at this point. Yeah, quite possibly. If indeed it is a single organic individual. I mean, there are a couple of guesses we could make with. Um, yeah, there are a couple of guesses we could make. Uh, one, they could have been working out of school using some knowledge from their day job that might be considered proprietary. You know, that got Blake Lemoyne fired. Uh, second, second, it could be it could be an op. It could be a front. It could be a government organization. This is it's I'm completely secure in saying that because there's no proof otherwise. Anyway, so there are controversies. Surprise with Bitcoin. It's got a shady origin story. Uh, it involves a lot of often misunderstood technology. Oh, and it's also a load of money. You can understand why Bitcoin is controversial, given those three factors. Governments are have always been publicly skeptical of Bitcoin and uh, blockchain technology in general. It's true that some outliers like El Salvador have adopted it as a recognized currency, but major economies, including Uncle Sam, to this day refuse to recognize it as what's called legal tender. And if you look at the, if you, if we assume the perspective of countries and financial institutions, then we can see how this idea, the skepticism and caution, makes sense. I mean, Bitcoin potentially does a lot of things that are dangerous if you're happy, uh, you know, at the top of a financial or governmental regime. The citizens of your country can undermine government authority because they can kind of circumvent and skate around capital controls. Obviously, this can help launder all sorts of things. It can disguise criminal activity for sure. And then the other thing, the third thing that they don't say as much out loud officially is that potentially Bitcoin and things like it could destabilize the entirety of the existing global money regime, global financial infrastructure. And then the irony there is for the longest time, the conversation from like, you know, crypto bros and and evangelists uh, has been this is an alternative to the crooked system of capitalism that that is is legally, you know, recognized. Uh, And, you know, you better get in while the getting's good, they say, Um, you know, because this is going to be the only game in town before you know it. And don't you want to, you know, protect yourself from from the ebbs and flows and the whims of, of the Fed and all that stuff yeah sure you do right? this thing's so stable man it's crazy <laughs> it's its own thing it's, rock, it's, not, baby. it's it's not gonna follow any of those trends right <laughs> well that's the idea but and and that's the question how long can this thing last right uh it could just be another currency related bubble This has definitely happened in the past with numerous things identified as currency by one civilization, culture, or another. From day one, there were plenty of critics who were certain that Bitcoin would eventually come crashing down. And now it appears they just might be correct. What are we talking about? We'll tell you after a word from our sponsor. Here's where it gets crazy. Bitcoin crashed. Whew. And boy, what a free fall. But like, so did the stock market, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, I think it's no, it's what we were talking about earlier. I think there's a, I don't know if there's a direct connection, but it certainly casts a little bit of question into this whole notion that Bitcoin is bulletproof and crypto is its own thing unconnected to the rest of the economy. Because these two things kind of happened in tandem, you know, I mean, we haven't experienced a full crash or a full recession, but it sure feels like we're heading that way. But the, the stock market isn't a currency, Right. If we're if the statement was the dollar crashed, right, that would be applicable to what's going on here, right? There's a difference. It feels like you're buying some kind of commodity, some kind of 
you know, sh- sh- uh, shares or stock when you're buying Bitcoin, I think, the way it feels when you've got it because it's worth so much real world money. But it is in itself a currency. Uh, I, th- I think we just, I, it's just, that's why it's weirding me out because we do think about it as a stock market going up and down, but in reality is the value of a currency. But the value of like traditional currencies, they don't ebb and flow the way cryptocurrencies do. No. Cryptocurrencies ebb and flow much more like stocks. And, and I believe are treated more speculatively in the way that stocks are often treated. That's why I think they're, they're sort of in the middle. Like they're, they're related, but, but different. But I see exactly what you're saying, Matt. And so this brings us to another, another important issue. I, I want to paint the scene here. So cast your memory back. By the end of 2021, Bitcoin itself had fallen 30% from its peak. Its peak was about $69,000, $70,000 per coin, uh, and it fell down to $47,686.81. Ethereum, which is sort of the Pepsi to the Coca-Cola here, also fell 23% to $3,769.70. And throughout a lot of uh, January, much of late January in 2021, uh, through, let's call it late April, cryptocurrency in general struggled. And Bitcoin was swinging back and forth, you know, Edgar Allan Poe pit in the pendulum style. Sometimes it was 35,000. Sometimes it was 48,000. And now look, if you're an investor, This is your what the F moment. But uh, before anyone panics, we have to note that Bitcoin value has fluctuated before. To your point, Matt, about treating something as a currency via an investment, it would be weird if an investment did not fluctuate to some degree. The crypto market, in fact, has fallen by 50% or more on four different occasions, including the current crypto winter of 2021-2022. But it's a little different now because back in the day, for a long time, Bitcoin was 95% of the crypto market until about 2013. So you could arguably just say the first crypto winter really was a Bitcoin winter. But this crash, the one you're in now, has people worried partially because of the many other factors involved as well as uh, the extent, or I should say the uh, timeline of the crash. It seems to be continuing. This is what is sometimes called a free fall. Anyway, if we go back, stay in 2021 for a second, this is the first time that a Bitcoin associated industry announces layoffs, job cuts, April 2021, just a few days after everything goes to pot. An outfit named BitMEX lays off 25% of its employees. Let's just fast forward, 2022, crash continues. As of the month we're recording this, July of 2022, both Bitcoin and Ethereum are down by more than 60% from their peak. Uh, I want to shout out a couple of journalists in this episode. One, Tom Mitchell Hill. Tom, I love your last name, uh, is writing at Cointelegraph and said, you know, just this past June, This means, in real terms, that more than 80,000 people who were millionaires, thanks to Bitcoin, are no longer millionaires. They're no longer in the money. Yeah, that, that, uh, I, when I first read an article from that outfit, I really thought it was Cohen Telegraph. Like, (laughs) I really thought. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) Uh, but no, that, that article, it's pretty intense. Can I just give you a quick rundown of those specifics there? Um, okay, so back on November 12th, just uh, this is from the article by Tom Mitchell Hill. Back on November 12th, just days after Bitcoin hit a new all time high of around $69,000 that Ben just mentioned, a little under 109,000 Bitcoin addresses reported, reported a balance of greater than a million dollars. So, an individual address, a wallet, right? So that's probably individuals, maybe a few people having multiple ones, but that's a lot of people, 109,000 who were uh, uh, at least a million dollars worth in there. So you fast forward to today, the day we're recording this, and uh, it says only 26,284 addresses now have holdings valued at over a million dollars. So like that, uh, 
eighty thousand people just got wiped out. That's insane to think about. It's it's wild, but also think how exponential the growth was. Of course, the decline is also going to be exponential. I mean, so many of these people like made their 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 money by getting in at the right time, and they didn't start with that much money. They they invested, you know, whatever a, a respectable amount, uh, and it, it blossomed into this crazy amount of money. But then, if you bet if the farm on those holdings, thinking it's just going to last forever, and you're leveraged against those holdings, that's something you can do with crypto. You don't ever have to cash out. A lot of people don't cash out. They just leverage against it. You can borrow against it. You know, there are, there are exchanges or, or wallets rather, like one called Nexo that allows you to leverage your holdings into zero interest loans that then you pay back with little you know, um, hits little, little taxes, I guess, on your holdings. But you never actually have to cash out. Because once you cash out, then you're out of the system, and then you're out of the game. So the, the, the goal for a lot of these people is to stay in the system. But, of course, when a hit like this happens, it's also going to be of epic proportions, you know, just like the, the, the wins were. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, the whales got hit as well. I'll take the hit on that one, guys, because I snuck in a tongue tongue twister in the, in the notes. Uh, there were, per uh, Mitchell Hill's reporting, there were, 10,587 addresses that had a minimum cash value of 10 million US dollars in November of last year. And now less than half of them are still at that level. Only 4,342 hold the same status. So quick cocktail napkin math, that's a 58% decline. And another note for anybody who likes dancing on graves <laughs> Please don't be that I told you so guy to your Bitcoin friends. Give them give them a couple weeks. You know, they got a lot of stuff going on. And how do we know these things? Well, the reason we know them is that Bitcoin has something really interesting. There is anonymity, but you can still, due to the nature of the interactions in this ecosystem, you can see address like which addresses have certain amounts of coin and right now bitcoin has been struggling to stay above twenty thousand dollars us per coin now uh, and like you said matt you see the decline with the people holding a million you see the decline with people holding more than 10 million now we have to ask what happened right it's a question so many people are asking and we will get into conspiratorial aspects here. But first, the, the best way to say it is there are a couple of factors we can point to with certitude. And there are several other factors we can guess at. First things first, I'll say this. The big boys, big fish, they wanted some more regulations. Uh, April 2021, the SEC starts swinging their uh, uh, mentionables around. Uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission of the U.S. says, OK, guys, pump the brakes. We need to put some regulations on these crypto agencies. And just that, just a, a financial superpower like the U.S. moving toward a regulatory environment made a lot of people sell off everything. I guess they, they were like, let's get while the getting's good. We'll support the cartel some other way. Get back into fine art. Where are loose diamonds? All that jazz. Uh, and then there's something that I, you know, I don't know how familiar this is to a lot of people, but there's something called stable coin. Stable coin is yeah. a, yeah, it's an, it's a crypto um, crypto thing that can occur in three different kind of buckets. So it's either collateralized by cryptocurrencies it's sort of based on other crypto or it's pegged to something like the euro or the u.s dollar which means it's fiat backed that's not a hot take those are fiat currencies or it relies entirely on algorithms to maintain supply and demand so it, it picks a certain relationship to something like a dollar and then it just modifies on the back end everything to make it maintain that value. Stablecoin is called stablecoin because as you can imagine, the idea, the main feature of this is that it is not supposed to be subject to all the wiles and whims of the marketplace. And then that proved to be untrue. Lunaterra, a huge stablecoin, crashed. And this was such a um, this was such a, a shock to the overall financial system of crypto that 
when it plunged in value by 80%, it rocked, it rocked the foundations of the entire crypto market. So that's one thing that happened. The stuff that was supposed to be stable turned out not to be stable in any case. And then, um, you know, we said the SEC started <laughs> started paying interest. But in general, whether or not you're in crypto, if you live in the U.S., Uncle Sam wants you to pay interest too. <laughs> Oh, what a terrible segue. No, everything's bad. Uh, hikes and in interest rates, that's that's huge. Like we're talking about, you mentioned earlier, Noel, the idea of a recession. Uh, historically, if you look back in the span of U modern U.S. civilization, when interest rates start rising aggressively, it is it is not proof, but it is definitely a sign that the Fed believes recession is on the horizon. So this hits all the investment things, you, all, most of the investment vehicles you can think of. Fed increases rates, stock market and the crypto market have this huge downfall because ultimately, you know, they're voting on articles of faith, right? It's worth how much other people want it. So investors start selling, and this creates a bloodbath in the crypto market because the more people, the secret of crypto is the more people who are selling off stuff in a short time interval, uh, the less and less individual Bitcoins are worth. Yeah, it is interesting to um, the link between inflation and uh, cryptocurrency, because, you know, in the same way, a lot of folks have touted cryptocurrency to be sort of resistant to some of the market trends that they were seeing, you know, hit, hit the stock market and all of that. Uh, it, similarly, it's been said that, that they're resistant to inflation. So I'm wondering with inflation kind of going up, why aren't cryptocurrencies doing better? Um I know it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of factors, but it is it is interesting uh, an additional thing to to consider. And then came financial troubles for a lot of the companies that handle cryptocurrencies, the ones that are actually exchanging things uh, that do other various things with Bitcoin uh, that have lots and lots of employees. Because it's kind of like Netflix. If you think about a lot of crypt cryptocurrency companies. They've been staffing up like crazy historically because there's just gains and gains and gains and gains. So they need more human beings to do more work. And then when these crashes happen, these winters come through, it gets cold and they got to they got to get rid of all these new people they've hired because their overhead becomes too expensive, which was the case with Celsius Network. This is one of those decentralized finance outfits, the things we've been talking about. They said they were putting a freeze on all crypto transactions, which is never good, right? That's like when you freeze the stock market because uh, stuff's going downhill, guys. We got to stop trading, Yeah, uh, which has happened, right? Well, I, I, you know, again, to your point, Matt, uh, this to your, to your beautiful point about currency versus investment, I would say a more immediate analogy, uh, even more impactful, would be the idea of banks not allowing cash withdrawals or withdrawals or transfers to other financial institutions. When that happens, it's uh, what what we could rightly call bad, bad. It's it's double plus ungood. So if you're banking at the Celsius network, then this is this is your Wells Fargo saying, we know you have money, you just can't have it. Because we don't have it. Yeah, well, that's the kind of stuff that happened like during the Great Depression. That's, that's a real bellwether of things to come. Yeah, and, yeah. and post something like that where there is some kind of freeze, uh, often, not always, as we saw with GameStop and some of the, some of the other weirdness that happened in the stock market uh, not that long ago, but what, what happens after one of those is a massive sell-off, and that is indeed what occurred with the Celsius network. Uh, and there are a bunch of other companies that went through like real rocky, <laughs> real rocky month. Yeah, yeah. And it's a real rocky month that appears to be going much longer than 30 days. It's a it's a not ending month. I don't know if it ever resolved, um, but a buddy of mine had some stuff in Celsius. And I think as far as he what, what he was getting for message boards and some maybe like more seasoned crypto people was that don't hold your breath. Yeah, unfortunately, others would follow suit. Uh, a lot of this uh, uh, 
really, if you look back on some of our previous work on this show, you'll what you'll see is the danger of feedback loops, and they can happen in any financial sphere. Shortly after our good friends at Celsius make their announcement, which they, by the way, they cited as a, a result of ex- a consequence of extreme market conditions. Shortly after they do this, another crypto exchange, Binance, which you've all heard of if you're involved in blockchain and Bitcoin, they do the same. But they say their freeze on Bitcoin withdrawals was quote, due to a stuck transaction causing a backlog. And originally, they said this will take 30 minutes to fix. Spoiler, it took longer than 30 minutes. Uh, In the case of Bitcoin specifically, experts are arguing something that I agree with wholeheartedly. This is a symptom of a larger global economic climate. Uh, BBC did a great job with this. Uh, they we pulled some quotes from this. They said, recession looms, inflation is soaring, interest rates are rising, living costs are biting. A little bit of accidental freestyle there. I like it. Stock markets are wobbling too with the US S&P 500 now in a bear market, meaning that it's down 20% from where it was. And they point out, we'll just summarize this part, that as a result of this, in a more hostile financial climate, Even the really big investors, like the people who don't really have jobs the way normal people do, the people who just move money around and live off the interest, they are less free with their spending and investing. And that means that if you are an ordinary investor, rank and file, you're not, you don't own a hedge fund, you're not a corporation, you're just, uh, you're just a schmuck, then you have less money in general to invest in anything So why would you invest in something that's not regulated, that doesn't have certain constraints? From this perspective, we see the argument becoming something like the same lack of regulation that made crypto so sexy and appealing also, for many investors, makes it too unpredictable, especially in times of austerity. Do you want to buy something that used to be $60,000, now it's $20,000, and just sort of roll the dice on whether it'll ever be $60,000 $60,000 and a penny, <laughs> like, or I don't know, 20000 and a penny might be more fair. So this feedback loop has been created. Bitcoin's value is tied to its desirability. The more people sell, whatever their reason might be, the less Bitcoin is worth. More people see the value decrease, maybe they sell as well. They cut their losses. They get out of the game. But it's too late. They're perpetuating that feedback cycle. Bitcoin has no tangible assets underpinning it. This is true. It means literally that the price is only defined by what people are prepared to buy it for. And then to your point, Matt, about dominoes falling, Coinbase later in June announced their own layoffs. They let go of uh, 18% of their workforce. And when they did this in their announcement, they didn't just say extreme market conditions. They used the term crypto winter. And if you are uh, interested in this, I would highly recommend reading that official statement. Uh, I thought it was transparent. I thought it was to the point. um, And I don't think it was good news. No, it was terrible news. And and Coinbase Global Incorporated which is a wonderful name, isn't the only one that was laying off people. There was also Crypto.com, Gemini Trust, BlockFi Incorporated. All of these companies had huge numbers of layoffs. And, uh, you know, just if you think about Coinbase, this is one of the biggest names out there in in the uh, crypto game. It, what is it? It had to lay off 18% of its workforce. 18%. 1,200 people. Like, that's a lot. Of layoffs. I mean, also crypto.com, which is probably the most recognizable one because they literally named the Staples Center after it. Uh, they had some pretty significant layoffs too. So everybody's getting everybody's getting a little bit of the splash pack. Actually, they're getting a lot a bit of the splash pack. And this is worrisome because with each announcement, with each decision, each layoff, each sell-off, the loop exacerbates, right? 
the pace quickens. And so you have to wonder eventually where the floor will be. But for many of us listening today, many of our fellow conspiracy realists, this doesn't feel like the whole explanation. You might be thinking, okay, guys, come on. What really happened? We'll pause and we'll, we'll tackle this after a word from our sponsors. Okay, here's a conspiracy theory. I don't know if you all have read this, but I enjoyed it. It's from Reddit. I want to shout out Juicy Juice Juice. Not spelled the it's way you think it's out. So it. credible. Uh, <laughs> it's fun to say. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Juicy juice. Um, soon to be Pulitzer Prize winning Juicy Juice Juice. No, seriously, I thought this was a really fascinating idea. I've been uh, following along with some uh, contacts who are listening today. I've been following the uh, the whole GameStop, Wall Street stonk stuff for a while now. And this conspiracy theory really interested me. The idea is Juicy Juice Juice is asking, what if crypto was purposely created to hide asset inflation, making another financial path for the U.S. dollar to pass through, inflating new different assets? Like what if – the the full quote – and you can see this in other media – the full quote is – Crypto creates the perfect trading vehicle for a short time before becoming the scapegoat for whatever crash is coming. If this is true, it would essentially mean that crypto either became or was explicitly created to function as a scapegoat. You know, it's getting pumped up into a bubble to absorb ordinary existing inflationary pressure. That's a cool, if that's true, that's a really impressive shell game, but it's currently very difficult to prove. And it would also, let's be honest, it would require some incredibly smart, dedicated people with an insanely sophisticated level of cooperation. I haven't seen proof for it yet. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Would it take a a ton of cooperation or would it, I mean, you just think about the 0708 crash, and that all had to do with the the amount of exposure big institutions had, right? The amount of money they had invested or tied up with subprime uh, assets and packages, right? Um, in this case, if there, when a major, major crash happens in the stock market rather than in the cryptocurrency world, you could blame you know, the collapse of other major investing institutions on their exposure to cryptocurrency. Because we know those major institutions are are investing more and more of their money into cryptocurrency, not a ton of it, right? Not enough to b- play the scapegoat, I don't think. But I know they are investing millions of dollars. I mean, I think that's a valid point, Matt. The, uh, there, uh, I still have some issues with this, though, I I think it's really clever. And I I will admit a little bit of a personal bias here because I miss the YouTube days where somebody with a name like Surf Daddy 69 Whole Hand XXX would make a great point about uh, the gold standard in the 1800s and would be able to write back and say like, oh, that's a great point. Uh, Surf Daddy 69 XXX or whatever. Uh, But Juicy Juice Juice does bring up a good... I'm going to say that name as juice, many juice, times as I can. Juice, juice, juice. Yeah. Yes. Oh, it's, God, uh, so many permutations. <laughs> right. Um, makes a good point. And I think you make a good point too there. The issue is that one would have to sort of... You can imagine the circumstances that would lead to that, but we would have to... If we were to prove that, we would, we would just need some more. Right, which is why Juicy Juice Juice is uh, astute when they call it a theory at this point. There's another crazy theory. I don't know how much time we want to spend on this one, but there's this idea that Russia may have added some high-octane fuel to the fire because of their central bank's statements. Uh, Russia's central bank came out not too long ago and demanded a blanket ban across the board on not only any crypto trading, but any crypto mining. They wanted to cut it off, to cauterize it, to amputate it from the system. They more or less called Bitcoin a pyramid scheme. 
And they said, look, if we keep messing with Bitcoin, it's going to pose a risk to the financial sovereignty 